Good afternoon, and I want to welcome you to another uh, episode of the Trumpet Series Bible Study Broadcast. This is your host, Brother Nick Bailey, coming to you live from the United Baptist Church Auditorium on this Thursday, February the 2nd, 2023. And I hope everybody's having a good day today. And uh, here we are right in the middle of this uh, Thursday afternoon. And I know some of you are at work and are involved in other various activities, but I wanted to go ahead and, and get one, bob, one, uh, one uh, episode of the broadcast in uh, this afternoon, and we could potentially do another one uh, before the day is over. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, two in one day. But uh, it's everything we can do a lot of times just to get one done. As I was out here late last night doing my study prep for today's uh, broadcast, what should have been yesterday's broadcast, and uh, but that's all right. God's got a plan, and I try not to allow myself to to become overly um, uh, stressed and concerned about uh, the specific details um, regarding when we do and when we're able to conduct. The broadcast, uh, we have to be flexible, again, um, especially when we consider all the other things that we have going on, but praise God the Lord's good, and I'm just thankful that He has provided us with this open door of ministry. So, um, praise the Lord, I hope everybody had a good Wednesday night, I hope everybody had good church services last night, I know here at United, the Lord blessed us. In a, um, in a special way, um, as we had good upstairs uh, prayer meeting and Bible study services and then had um, another uh, good crowd of young people who uh, participated in the United for Christ Youth Ministry here at United Baptist Church, we, had, we uh, were able to uh, bring two full van loads uh, full of kids to church last night, so Praise the Lord for that, and I do encourage you to pray for our United for Christ Youth Ministry here at United as we consider ourselves to be on the front line, uh, fighting tooth and nail against the devil for the very souls of these young people. I'm sure you'd agree with me when I say that the devil is wrecking havoc in the lives of our young people more so now uh, than what he ever has, so if we're going to stand a fighting chance of turning the tide against Satan in our battle for the youth of this nation, we must match the intensity of the devil, and we must tug harder on our end uh, for their behalf than he is pulling and tugging against them uh, on his end. So uh, one thing about it, and we're going to say more about that um, during today's uh, episode of the broadcast, but the devil's very, very persistent in what he does. Satan is not lazy. Uh, amen. And, and, and sad to say, he works ten times harder than most Christians will ever, th ever think about hard uh, working. He's not going to give up. He's not going to quit. But until God uh, uh, throws him into hell where he belongs, he's going to keep uh, doing his best to resist the saints and uh, oppose the work of God. Uh, thank God he's going to fail. And fail miserably. But before we get into the Bible study portion of to today's broadcast, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, again, I do implore you to pray for the Trumpet Series broadcast that the Lord will continue to expand and enlarge the coast of this ministry to use it to magnify and proclaim His Word and most of all that lost souls might come to know Jesus uh, as their Savior as God providentially allows them to either watch or listen to the broadcast. Let's pray, Father in heaven, I love you, and Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for a privilege we have just to, um, um, amen, to conduct this ministry that you've entrusted to us. And Lord, thank you, Lord, for the strength that you gave to us last night to study and prepare uh, this, uh, uh, the content uh, of uh, this program. And Lord, now I pray that you give us the strength as we preach and, uh, and proclaim the truths of your inerrant word. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love the Bible. Lord, I love your people. And God, I pray that you would take the truths 
of the Word of God, Lord. And um, uh, Lord, you said you promised us that your Word would not uh, return void, but it would accomplish the purpose you send it out to do. So, Lord, do that. And Lord, I pray your 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 um, Word would find a good um, place to take root in our hearts. Uh, Lord, it did grow up and bear an abundance of fruit in our lives, God, that your word might be a lamp in our feet and a light in our paths, that we might hide your word in our hearts, so we might not sin against thee. Honor your word, exalt your son by way of your humble servant. Lord, we're going to praise you for who you are and what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so um, uh, excited about uh, this episode, and like I said, Lord willing, if God allows us to do so we've got some other responsibilities and activities to do before the day's over but we're going to try to uh, to um, uh, to pack two broadcast into uh, this Thursday so on yesterday's edition of the program we did introduce this new section of chapter number eight as we examine verses 31 and 32 of our text and in that study I told you that specifically, or per, that I personally believe, this current and final section of chapter number 8 provides us with what I consider to be some consequential results of the specific details of God's so great a plan of salvation that we uh, discussed so thoroughly last week. Again, uh, these details exist and are pri provided to us by Paul in verses number 28 through 30 of the chapter. And I said that in verse 31, we find the first one of these consequential effects, which I believe to be the fact that it's the verse itself says, if God be for us, then who can be against us? Aren't you thankful if you're saved today that the Lord your God is for you? He's behind you. Uh, he's in support of you. He's in your corner. And he's taking it all and work it together for your good and for his glory. Verse number 32, I said that I believe the second of these results of God's great plan of salvation is the fact that uh, if Jesus himself were not enough, the Lord is also uh, both willing and able to bestow upon us and to freely give us all things. And um, so those are two of the consequential effects of our salvation. If God be for us, who can be against us? And then the fact that God was not, uh, um, uh, amen, He chose not to spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Uh, God is both willing and able to freely give to us and provide us all things. So today let's continue uh, examining some of these results and consequences of God's uh, great salvation plan let's begin today by noticing what i'd like to identify as being an accusation who shall lay anything to the charge who shall lay anything to the charge verse number 33 um, we find the first of three who statements the three who statements that occur in repetition with each other beginning in verse 33 and continuing on down through Verse number 35. And these three who statements that are found in these verses, they all uh, exist in the form of questions. The first one being, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And here the Greek word uh, ekleo uh, is translated into the phrase, Lay anything to the charge of. Again, ekleo, ekleo. There you go. Uh, again, I'm not a master Greek uh, pronunciator. But this is translated into the phrase, lay anything to the charge of, and it simply means to bring a charge against or an accusation or an indictment against a person or, or individual. Mm. And specifically, I believe Paul has in mind the frequent allegations that Satan is in the business of bringing uh, before the throne of God and making uh, against us um, uh, on a regular basis. Now we know that in Revelation chapter number 12 verse 10, mm. Satan is referred to as being the accuser of the brethren, which suggests the fact that one of the things he is most known for is bringing charges, allegations, and accusations up against the people of God. And according to this verse, the Bible says, for the, for the accuser of our brethren 
is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. And certainly the account of Job, as it is recorded for us in chapter number 1 and 2, where Satan questioned God before his throne whether or not, um, as to whether or not Job really and truly did fear the Lord. And then he told the Lord, uh, Satan did, that if he, um, if God would allow the body of Job to be afflicted with disease, then Job would um, consequently, uh, subsequently curse the Lord right to his face. And of course we know that's not the case, but Job ended up responded by saying, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And what an example there is uh, for us to follow um, uh, through Job's attitude that he maintained throughout uh, the trial of his sickness. Now another interesting passage that may also make reference to this truth is found in Zechariah chapter number, uh, number 3, verse 1. And this is something that uh, I'm not sure I'd ever saw before until the Lord brought it to my attention in my study. Zechariah chapter number 3, verse 1, the Word of God says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So here it seems as if both Satan and the angel of the Lord, which I believe to be a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are standing, they are both standing uh, in this situation uh, at the right hand of the throne of God. And while the angel of the Lord is standing on behalf of Joshua the high priest, the Bible tells us here that Satan is also standing there resisting either the angel, angel Joshua, or both. So, now we don't know everything that relates to this particular truth. Some, it's, it's definitely somewhat of a mystery to us. Uh, it does seem as though, according to the Word of God, there is some kind of regular and routine interaction between Jesus and the devil as they strive and wrestle over the lives and souls of God's people. But again, the question Paul is posing here uh, uh, concerning the other truths he has unveiled uh, here in these verses is who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Again, that who statement that's posed in the form of a question. Now, we might say it this way, who can bring up any charges? Who can bring uh, any allegations or accusations against we who are saved, especially in light of God's great salvation plan? And we know that the concise answer to that question is simply no one. In other words, just as no one can be against us in light of the fact that God is for us, hallelujah, I don't have to worry about any uh, one being against me. Um, the, actually, that's the fourth who. Uh, I just now saw that. The fourth who of this section. Who, who, like a hoot owl. Hallelujah. Uh, amen. But if God be for us, then who can be against us? Uh, amen. So also, no one can rightfully or reasonably bring up any kind of charges, allegations, or accusations against those who know what it is to be saved by God's amazing grace either. And here, in just a few moments, we're going to discuss the specific reason why that is the case. But first, let's notice the election, verse number 33, of God's elect. Who is able to bring any charges uh, or any accusations uh, against God's elect? In this statement, Paul uses the word elect to identify those who know what it is to personally experience uh, God's so great a plan of salvation. And if you remember, we considered the doctrine of election to a certain extent during one of last week's episodes of the Trumpet Series broadcast. But just in case you did not watch or listen to that program, let me review a few things that we talked about during our previous study. In the Greek language, the word eklektos is translated into our English word elect. And it simply means to choose to elect or select out of a larger group or gathering. And certainly the doctrine of election is another one of those principles that makes people very nervous, if for no other reason than because of its controversial nature. I mean, so many different ideas on what it is uh, to be elect, uh, elected, part of the elect. Yet just like the doctrines of foreknowledge and predestination, of which we also discussed thoroughly 
during at least a couple of last week's uh, programs. So also, whether or not we want to admit or accept it as such, the doctrine of election is irrefutably and undeniably a Bible truth. And once again, some might unfairly label me as being a hyper-Calvinist for simply making such a statement. Amen. That's all right. Uh, call me what you want to. Uh, amen. But I know my heart. I'm not a hyper-Calvinist, but I am a Bible believer. You know, somebody wants to press me. I said it last week. Amen. Are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? Amen. Well, those are man-made doctrines. Why do we have to, uh, uh, why, why do we, you know, why would someone try to force me to fit my ideologies and my philosophies as it relates to the Word of God into some man-made category or, or classification? Amen. Uh, again, uh, balance is the key. You know, fi and that's not compromise. I mean, we're recognizing two um, uh, distinct truths that uh, undeniably exist within the realm of Scripture. I'm talking about the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And uh, again, we may not be able to uh, mesh those together, uh, amen, or uh, coincide them with each other, amen, but I'm just telling you, we need to find a balance between the doctrine of God's sovereignty uh, as opposed to the responsibility, individual responsibility of man. Uh, God is sovereign, but man is responsible. Amen. Let's not be extremists. Amen. So if you want to just uh, force me to make a confession or an admission regarding just exactly where I stand on these doctrines, well, just call me a an R. Malvinist or a Calvinian, hallelujah, amen. Uh, somewhere in the middle, hallelujah, praise God. Uh, I'm a Bible believer, I believe the Word of God, and I don't want to be afraid of or to skip over uh, truths that if we'll study them and examine them at face value, take them as they are, and according to what the Bible says, man, we'll get a tremendous blessing uh, because of it. Uh, and all I know to tell you today is that if you have a problem with the word elect or election, then take it up with God. Because He's the one who sovereignly chose to include these, this word or these words and this doctrine within the text of our King James Bibles. But as I told you last week, the problem with election does not uh, have to do necessarily with the identity or the meaning of the word. Why? Because as honest as I know how to say it, the word elect or election it uh, pretty much means what it says and says what it means. And again, the word eclectos means those who are chosen, those who are elected, or those who are selected out of a larger group or assembly. As the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 4, according as he hath chosen, and that word chosen there is that same uh, Greek word for eclectos, uh, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And ultimately, what really matters when it comes to the doctrine of election has to do not with the definition of the word, but the basis, the method, or the motivating force uh, or factor that lies behind our election. Now, according to the hyper-Calvinist God, and again, I, I discussed all of this last week, but I'm just trying to reiterate it to you here today. But according to the hyper-Calvinist, God has chosen or elected we who are saved into salvation on the basis of His love. Or we might say that our election in Christ, according uh, um, to the hyper-Calvinist, unto salvation is based upon the fact that God might somehow love us more than He loves uh, those who are not chosen and have not been made a part of the elect. And to the, to the extreme hyper-Calvinists, they might even question whether or not God even loves those who are not chosen as being uh, a part of the elect at all whatsoever. Well, the problem with this idea is the fact that it is not biblical. It violates the simple, clear-cut truths of uh, the Scriptures that tell me that God is no respecter of persons. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And even what we might consider to be the most basic and elementary uh, truth of all that exists, exists in the Bible, which is the fact that for God so loved 
the world. And friend, when, 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 the, when the Bible uses the word world, it doesn't mean a select group out of the world. It means the world. Amen. All men who uh, dwell within the realm of the cosmos. So when we consider the overall context of the Scripture in its entirety, we must say unequivocally, unequivocally and indisputably that our status as being a part of the elect cannot be based or founded on a supposed greater love that God has for us uh, more than He does others. Like it or not, friend, and I know this is going to burst some of your bubbles, but God is not an elitist. He is not prejudiced. He does not show favoritism. And He does not view or, or see some men in a more favorable light or way than He does others. You say, Brother Nick, but if that's the case, then how can the doctrine of election be correct? And if it is correct, then what is the basis? If it's not His love that drives Him and causes Him to choose, elect, and select we who are saved unto salvation, very simply, uh, our election as saved, born-again Christians, it's not based upon the love of God, but it's based upon the foreknowledge of God. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 2, it says that we are elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So very simply, God has not chosen, elected, or selected we who are saved unto salvation based upon a, a superior love that He has for us or others, but He has chosen us before the foundation of the world, before God ever spoke the worlds into existence, uh, based upon His foreknowledge. And by foreknowledge, I'm not talking about a foreordination, a predestination, or a predetermining of who God supposedly wants to be saved as opposed to those that He may not want to be saved. No, my friend, uh, God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. His will is not for is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Uh, God doesn't want anybody. God is not a, some sadistic force or being that takes pleasure. Amen. In the condemnation uh, or the death of the wicked. Amen. But when we use the word knowledge for knowledge, we're talking about the fact that God know, knows, and He did know beforehand and ahead of time. Uh, how we will respond and react to an invitation that He may give us to be saved. And not just that, but I also believe that God's foreknowledge, um, or we might use the word prescience or pre-science, which means a foreknowledge. Science is word, or excuse me, science. The word science means knowledge, and the word pre means before. But, uh, amen, the foreknowledge of God includes the Lord's knowledge of all of the, uh, uh, the known clauses, contingencies, probabilities, prob uh, uh, amen, possibilities, and actualities of how we would respond to all of the uh, various scenarios or situations that, we might, that might occur and take place in our lives. God knows what could be, what might be, what will be. And, he, and our election is based upon His foreknowledge. But also, and just as importantly, God's foreknowledge is ultimately, ultimately based upon His overall omniscience or the fact that God simply knows and is aware of all things. Bottom line, our election as saints of God, which is ordained and predetermined. That is what, amen, God, uh, amen, your, your salvation, amen. Your salvation, amen, uh, is not predetermined, so to speak. It's based upon the, pers the, the personal responsibility you have to make a choice as to whether or not to receive Christ or to reject Him. That is the doctrine of man's responsibility. So your salvation itself is not predetermined. Amen. It's, you know, we're, we're not living in a world of fatalism. Amen. I'm not a fatalist. By any means, but your election is ordained and determined from the very foundation of the world. Before God ever spoke the worlds into existence, He had already elected you unto, chosen you unto salvation, uh, amen, based upon His foreknowledge of the decisions that He knew you would make. Uh, amen. Not upon His love or some biased turn or inclination that he supposedly may have towards you and over others, 
but your election unto salvation, uh, amen, is based upon the foreknowledge and the omniscient knowledge and awareness God has of all things. You say, preacher, now I'm really confused. Well, join the club, amen, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now there's a justification. It is God who that justifieth. Verse number 33. With this statement, Paul provides us with an answer to the question as to why no one is able to bring any charge, accusation, or allegation up against God's people. And the reason for this is because God is the one not only who has justified us in the past tense, but will also continue to justify us in the present and future tense as well. Notice the ETH ending, uh, amen, that exists at the end of the word justify that is found here in verse number 33. That, uh, that suggests a continual action of the verb. And if you are a student of the King James Bible, you know that it is always, anytime you see that ETH ending, it always implies a continual action. Uh, amen. And as we, and, and again, what that means here is that uh, we have been justified uh, in the past, but we will continue to be justified, still be justified. Uh, not a progressive, it's not a progressive action, but it's something that continues. Uh, a, a, amen. A, a state that we will uh, continue to be in. Uh, we have been justified. In the past, we are, God still sees us as presently being justified right now. And He will also continue to view us as being justified in the future. And remember, justification is not a progression. Sanctification is a progression. But justification is an instantaneous act. But it, it will continue to exist. You will continue to be justified from the moment that you get saved until the day God calls you home to glory. All right, so um, uh, as we move on in our study uh, of the next word, verse, we're going to find the reason why we can say that with such confidence and certainty. But from past studies, we learned how that the word justified means to be declared righteous. And we know that it is a legal term that suggests a verdict that has been reached and issued out by an authoritative, an authoritative judge or a high court. And in this case, or in the case of we who are saved, God is the master judge of heaven's high court. He has issued a verdict of being innocent. Uh, he has found us out to be not guilty. Uh, amen. Even though the devil has brought us to trial. Amen. God has already issued a verdict. Amen. He's already reached a decision. And that decision has been announced. And we, the, the, the gavel has fallen. Amen. And our case has been dismissed and we've been declared not guilty. And even though we are in essence guilty, and even though many of the charges Satan makes against us are true and correct, because of the righteousness of God's Son Jesus Christ, that has been imputed unto our, the accounts of our lives, God, the authoritative judge of heaven's high court, can rightfully and righteously issue a ruling of innocence and a verdict of being not guilty on behalf of those who place their faith and trust in Him. And I want to remind you that in heaven there's no such thing as an appeals court, hallelujah, uh, or a retrial. And you and I who are saved, we have been justified, we have been declared righteous. We don't ever have to worry about the verdict that, has, that was issued in our case and on our behalf being overturned or overruled. Amen. Amen. What, when God uh, declares us innocent and when God justifies us, He does so for, um, time, for, for all time and for all eternity. Amen. When God delivers someone or declares someone not guilty, it means that they are not guilty. It means their case is closed and it has been dismissed forever and forever. Now, I don't know about anybody else today, but I am so glad for the fact that I have been declared righteous. I have been justified, which means in the sight of my uh, of, of the God of heaven, 
The Lord views me just as if I have never sinned. Amen. Sorry if I seem a little slow uh, here today. Amen. I was up rather late studying and preparing uh, for this message. So it's almost like there's a, a lapse. Amen. There's a, a buffering. My mind's buffering. There's a buffering going on uh, in between the time that these thoughts come uh, into my mind and, and, and come on out of my mouth. Praise the Lord. Uh, amen. Maybe we'll get a better connection before the broadcast is over. Now let's notice a condemnation. Verse 34, Who is he that condemneth? In this verse, the word katakrino is translated into our English word condemneth, and it simply means to pass down uh, a sentence upon someone who has been convicted and found guilty of a charge or an allegation that was brought up and made against them. And with this question, we find the second who statement that is found within our current passage of study. Actually, it's the third. Uh, amen. Who can be, if God's for us, then who can be against us? That's number one. Uh, number, number, number two is that uh, who can bring any charges against us if God is the one who justifies? But thirdly, who is he that condemneth? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, and honestly, the question Paul asks here in this verse really is somewhat of a moot point, seeing how that it is illogical, if not uh, outright impossible altogether, to hand, hand out a sentence upon, or a punishment upon someone who has not been convicted, but has been found innocent and declared not guilty of all charges that were brought against them. I mean, I can't say that I've ever heard of a sentence or a punishment being handed out uh, and passed down upon someone who was found innocent uh, and not guilty of the charges that were brought against them. Have you ever heard of such a thing? And to me that would be ludicrous and ridiculous to even consider uh, a, pu a punishment or a sentence being handed out to someone who has been, uh, uh, amen, uh, uh, found not guilty and declared innocent. And, and you know, spiritually speaking, the moment that I was justified, declared righteous, and found out by God to be not guilty of the charges that were brought against me by the devil, the moment that I was cleared of all the charges, uh, amen, any hope whatsoever that Satan might have previously had of me receiving a sentence of death and condemnation was permanently dashed and forever taken away. Hallelujah. Praise His name. I'm telling you, friend, when Satan filed charges against my life in heaven's high court, he was seeking nothing short or less than the penalty of death. And no doubt about it, that old devil would not be satisfied until he saw me burning and frying eternally in the flames and fires of hell for the crimes that I had done and the sins that I had committed. Yet when the gavel fell, by way of God's ruling that was issued forth on behalf of my case. I was cleared of all the ch charges. I was found to be innocent and not guilty of the allegations that Satan had, uh, had made against my life. On that day, all hope was lost of the devil getting ever getting any satisfaction whatsoever of seeing my carcass burn and fry in hell's flames. And ever since that verdict was reached, and from the time the gavel fell in my case, I could and will continue to rest perfectly well at night, knowing that there is absolutely no chance whatsoever of the devil being able to sentence my soul to an eternity of condemnation, suffering, and hell's flames. Amen. Or as Paul himself wrote early in verse number 1 of the same chapter, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them what you're in, Christ Jesus. And brethren, if you'll get a hold of what, the, uh, what all that entails and what all is involved in the fact that, uh, amen, your, the verdict has been reached, uh, amen, you were cleared of all the charges, and as a result, there would, never will be a sentence of guilt, a sentence of death uh, handed down upon your life. And once again, all I know to say about that is praise the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. To think that because of Jesus and what He did for me, I don't ever have to worry about going to hell. Amen. 
or having what amounts to be a sentence of death or condemnation uh, being passed down uh, upon my life. I am not going to hell, but I'm going to heaven. I have been cleared of charges. My case has been dismissed. I've, I'm dismissed. I've been justified. I've been declared righteous. Amen. And uh, amen. My case has been forever tossed out of heaven's high court. There are no appeals courts in heaven. There's no such thing as a, as a retrial. Amen. Uh, forgiven, forgotten forever. Somebody say amen. Amen. In fact, we might say that the old devil is the one who has to worry about the death penalty. Why? Because whether he likes it or not, an eternal sentence of death uh, and condemnation has been issued down upon him. And whether or not he wants to admit it, he's the one that's currently on death row. Whether he has no, or where he has no hope of ever being pardoned by the great judge of heaven's high court. I'm telling you what, friends, through God's so great a plan of salvation, he turned the tables on the devil. And just like what happened with old Haman in the Old Testament, the uh, uh, book of, of, of Esther, when ha Haman ended up hanging on the very same gallows he had built and prepared for God's people. Amen. The devil's going to uh, end up burning and frying in hell forever in that same hellish place that he has done everything he could to send God's people to. So also, the old devil's going to spend an eternity in hell. Uh, amen. And once again, to that I say praise the Lord's high and holy name. Now there's a prescription. Trying to finish up here today. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Here we find what I like to refer to as a twofold formula God has used to both secure and ensure the past, present, and future justification of His children. Now, I believe the first part of this formula has to do with the fact that Christ died for us. And that goes right back to verse number 32, where Paul wrote, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Aren't you thankful that God didn't hold anything back, but he, and He didn't spare the best that He offered? But He emptied heaven's bank account, praise God. Uh, amen. Uh, the, the, uh, heaven's, uh, heaven's bank account went bankrupt, praise God, when God uh, sent His best, Jesus Christ. He emptied the cupboard, hallelujah. Uh, amen. He didn't spare His own Son, but He delivered Him up for us all. He, God gave everything when He gave the Lord Jesus Christ uh, it, so that we might be saved. Also, I believe this same truth can be found in Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, where in these verses the Bible says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Certainly, we know that our salvation is at least partly determined by the vicarious and substitutionary death of Jesus as He died in our place and suffered for our sins on Calvary's rugged cross. Yet in reality, I believe the death of Christ only served as a partial insurance and a partial guarantee of the justification uh, of we who are saved. We are not just justified by His death, but we're also justified and declared righteous on the base of uh, the resurrection of Jesus as well. Friend, if all you and I had to lean on, trust in, and depend upon for the security of our soul's salvation was the death of Christ, there really would be no insurance or guarantee for us at all. We would still be lost in our sins. Chapter number 15 of the book of 1 Corinthians, verse number 17, if, we, if it were only for the first part of the prescription of justification, there'd be no hope for us and we would still be dead in our trespasses and in our sins. You say, but preacher... What is the second aspect and what is the second portion of God's sovereignly ordained prescription of justification? Very simply, it's the bodily resurrection of our Savior that ultimately ensures and guarantees the fact that we who are saved will forever and always be viewed as being justified in the eyes of the Lord our God. And that's where uh, uh, we get back to verse number 33 where it says that it is God that justifieth. Amen. Not that He continually 
uh, uh, progressively justify us, but He continues to see us as being justified. Uh, he, view, he saw us as being justified in the past. He currently sees us as being justified in the here and now, and He will forever, until the day of our glorification, He will continue uh, to, to view and see our lives as being just as if we never sinned. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. You see, friend, the vicarious death of Christ is what God used to pay the price for our sins, but the bodily resurrection of Christ is what He used to remove the penalty of our sins, which is eternal death and separation from God's suffering in the eternal flames and fires of a devil's hell. Amen. The, the price was paid through His death. The penalty was removed through His resurrection. And that is a blessing. And, and it's only through the reality of the resurrection that we who are saved can really and truly say that we will forever be seen as being justified in the sight of the Lord our God. And as a result, there is absolutely no hope whatsoever of anyone, not even Satan himself, of being able to condemn or sentence our souls to the flames and the fires of an eternal hell. That's why we can confidently and assuredly say that there really and truly is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Not just because of the vicarious death of Christ, but also by way of the visible and bodily resurrection of our Savior as well. And what we're doing really right here, friends, we are setting the table for the remainder of the chapter. Amen. Paul is just trying to exhaust every resource, um, uh, you know, uh, at his disposal to demonstrate uh, once and for all and beyond any shadow of a doubt whatsoever that there really is truly no condemnation and there is no hope of anything separating us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And that will be the study of hopefully later on this evening and definitely tomorrow's episode of the Trumpet Series. All right, verification. Amen, I've got to wrap this up. Who is even at the right hand of God? With this statement, Paul provides us with some extra proof and evidence of the fact that there is absolutely no way whatsoever of anyone being able to condemn we who are saved as a result of the eternal and never-ending status we who are saved now have as being justified. In other words, just in case there might still be any little silver a uh, sliver or inkling of a doubt in our minds that it might still be possible for we who are saved to somehow be condemned and go to hell in spite of the vicarious death and bodily resurrection of Jesus. The apostle provides what we might refer to as the death nail or the ace in the hole, so to speak, that seals the deal and settles the argument once and for all regarding any possible way we who are saved might still somehow be condemned and end up suffering hell's flame. Again, friend, I just want to repeat what I said earlier, and that is there is no way whatsoever that someone that has been found out not guilty, the charges, you've been cleared of all the charges, but yet still you may somehow end up suffering. A sentence of death may be passed on you, even though you have been cleared of all the charges. No, my friend. But here the proverbial ace in the hole that served as the closing argument that Paul uses to settle the issue uh, once and for all that provides the ultimate insurance and guarantee of our total and final standing of being forever justified in God's sight is the fact that Christ, not only did He die for us, not only did He uh, rise from the dead, defeating hell, death, hell, and the grave, but He is currently in heaven seated at the very right hand of the throne of God. In other words, not only did Jesus die for our sins, not only did He rise from the dead on the third day, but hallelujah and praise the Lord for the fact that He is still alive and currently is seated on His throne at the Father's right hand. And all this, and all this does is to add more umph and more of an emphasis to the assertion that Paul makes at the end of Romans chapter 5, verse number 10, where the Bible says that not only are we saved, 
by his death, but we're also saved by his life as well. You say, Brother Nick, where is Jesus right now and what is his current location? Simply put, Jesus is even right now at, the very, at this very moment seated at the very right hand of his Father's throne. Mark 16, 19. Let me give you some scripture. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Colossians 1, 1, Paul wrote, if ye, then be, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Hebrews 1, 3, uh, the apostle, I believe, again wrote, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things, by the word of His power, where he, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down uh, on the right hand of the Majesty on high. Hebrews 8, 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the Majesty in heavens. In Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places, made with hands which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 12, 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Finally, 1 Peter 3, 22, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. As a side note, the located place of being at the Father's right hand carries with it this idea of a position of prominence, prestige, power, and authority. The New Testament refers over and over again to the fact that, that, that God the Father has put all things and under the feet of His Son, Jesus Christ, which signifies the fact that all things are subject to the authority that has been delegated and designated unto Him by God the Father. Man, I'm having a, uh, having a time preaching today. Occupation, verse 34, who also maketh intercession for us. Once again, in the ETH, ETH ending, uh, amen, implying a continual action. He continues to make intercession for us on behalf of the throne of God. Having already answered the question as to Christ's current location, Paul now turns the focus of his attention towards the current designated work and heavenly occupation of our Savior. We might say it this way, now that the apostle has determined where Jesus is currently at, he now writes to determine what Christ is now doing and what work He is currently involved in. Uh, amen. Somebody said, well, Jesus', is, 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 Jesus work is done. No, it's not. Yes, He cried out, it is finished. Amen. That completed God's plan of redemption. But now Jesus has moved on to a, uh, another work and another job that God, had, the Father, has delegated unto Him, and that is the work of being our mediator, our intercessor and our heavenly advocate as He makes intercession for us uh, while He is seated at um, the right hand of the Father's throne. Amen. So notice again, again the, ETH, the ETH ending is used suggesting a continuing and an ongoing process. And once again, I believe this refers back to the ongoing charges, accusations, and allegations that Satan continues to make against God's people before the throne of God, which are described by Revelation chapter number 12, verse 10, as being made day and night. That's right. Uh, and, and I know that's kind of mysterious to us, and it's hard for us to understand uh, how all that works and takes place. But one thing we can say about the devil, and one thing we must give him credit for, is the fact that he does not give up easily. And he will not go down without putting uh, up a fight first. Uh, certainly, the devil is much more persistent in his uh, desires, fulfilling his desires, uh, amen, that are contrary to God's will than we uh, uh, who are saved are in being obedient to the will of God. S Satan is persistent when it comes to the threatening slanders, railings, charges, and allegations that he is in the business of making against us 
as he regularly and routinely goes before our Father's throne. Let me read that verse again that we mentioned, Zechariah 3, 1. The Bible says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And how fascinating of a thing it is to consider how that even now after uh, we've been cleared of all the charges, the verdict of justification, not guilty, uh, amen, we've been declared innocent. And an announcement has been made concerning the people of God. Uh, praise the Lord. We have been declared righteous just as if we've never sinned, yet still the Bible at least implies and alludes to an ongoing feud and a very intense dispute of resistance that is still taking place right now at this very moment before the very throne of God. And I don't understand all that, but that's what the Bible seems to indicate to us. As Satan, as the prosecuting attorney, and Jesus, as the defense attorney, they argue and fight it out against one another regarding the potential guilt or innocence uh, that the people of God who are saved by His amazing and marvelous grace. Are we guilty or innocent? Yet we know that Satan is doing nothing more than wasting his time as the verdict has been reached, the decision has been made, and the case has been dismissed and has forever been thrown out of heaven's high court. And I don't know about you, friends, but I'll be so forever thankful and grateful for the fact that the old account of my case has been settled long ago according to the words of that old hymn. It says that the record's clear today and He's washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. And now each and every single time that Satan breathes forth a fresh batch of new charges, accusations, and allegations against my name, many times sadly and tragically which are true, yet it never fails when the devil stands and brings an objection against a testimony that is being given out or evidence that is being offered up uh, in our defense by uh, Big Brother Jesus every single time when the old devil stands and says, I object, Your Honor. God the Father just sighs His eyes. Uh, he rolls His eyes and He says, Overruled! And the devil has no other choice but to sit down, shake his head in sorrow, as the testimony of Jesus continues to overrule the counter evidence that is provided by the devil. And I've got news for you, friends. The only way and the only hope, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're wrapping it up, we're almost finished here. Uh, the only way and the only hope Satan could ever have of appealing our case and overruling the verdict that has been passed down and reached and will continue to be settled from now through all, throughout all eternity. The only uh, way that Satan could potentially overrule the verdict or appeal our case, amen, is if he somehow kills Jesus. If he somehow is able to remove his authority and cause all of that evidence that currently remains and under the Savior's feet to be brought to light and introduced into heaven's high court and used uh, as evidence against us. But I've got news for you, friends. Jesus will only die once. In fact, the devil didn't even kill him the first time, but instead Jesus willingly and voluntarily offered up himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And the devil can just forget about killing Jesus. Oh, brethren, he'd like to do it, but he's not going to do so. And because of that, all of those classified documents, boy, we're hearing a lot in our day about classified documents. But friend, there are some classified documents, amen, that currently remain sealed and under the feet of Jesus, amen. They have not been permitted or allowed to be introduced into heaven's high court as evidence against us, amen. They are, they are sealed, they are classified, uh, amen, they are hidden and under the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And they're going to stay there. Why? Because according to Hebrews 7.25, the Bible says, Wherefore He is able uh, also to save them to the uttermost, that coming to God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. And by, the, by, the, by way of the power of His endless life, not only His sinless death, but His endless life, Jesus Christ, our mediator, our intercessor, and our heavenly advocate, has eternally obtained, secured, as, and has forever protected Perfected, excuse me, 
eternal salvation for all of God's saints who have been, are continuing to be, and will always be viewed as justified and declared righteous by heaven's high court throughout all eternity. Isn't that a blessing? And man, I'll tell you what, when we start getting into all that's involved and what it means to be justified, it just thrills our souls. And it ought to cause us to have a shouting spell just to think about all God's done for us. Father in heaven, I love you today and I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to conduct this another episode of the Trumpet Series Bible Study Broadcast. I've done my best here this afternoon to deliver just exactly what you'd have me to say. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for enlightening me regarding these truths and, and uh, giving me the strength and ability even into the wee hours of last night to prepare the content of today's broadcast. Lord, thank you for giving me the strength to deliver it and to preach it. Lord, I pray that it would be half as much of a blessing to those who, ha who either have watched, will watch, or will eventually listen to uh, these, these truths, God, as it has been such a great blessing to me uh, to, to prepare it, to study it, to glean it, and to give it out, Lord, as you first gave it to me. Lord, help us to serve you, help us to live for you. Uh, God, help us, Father, Lord, just to continue to have confidence in knowing that regardless of what the devil says, uh, Father, you see us as being justified, and you will forever continue to view us as being justified. Why? Because, God, our case has been kicked out of heaven's high court, and we have been forever cleared of all the charges. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. May God richly bless you is my prayer, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of this Thursday. God bless.